and for all. Um, let me look on Angel and we'll look at two things. We'll look to see if there's something that says No. Why would you say that? All right, let's see. Oops, that's not it. All right, CISS 216. Semester project. There's no due date listed there. Okay. And there's no due date listed on any of my assignments. Why not? Where are the due dates? The due dates are listed on the syllabus. Do, 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 do. Pardon me? I think the authentication of the Oh. All right. Let me zoom in a little bit. All right, right here. Um, I guess, I don't know. There we go. Do. Assignments due Wednesday of indicated week. This is week 11. The project design is due this week. So when does that mean it's due? It's due on Wednesday. Okay. Um, you thought it was due 11-3? Yeah. Well, again, due assignments due the Wednesday of the indicated week. All right. Now, the thing is, 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 you know, despite what it says on my syllabus about deducting for lateness, I think you'll find I'm one of the most flexible professors as far as late assignments go. So, it's not that huge of a deal. Don't sweat it. All right. Uh, different professors have different personalities and have different policies. There are some professors I know that are very strict. Like, if I said it's due by 8 o'clock on Tuesday, if you turn it 8 one, it's late. Well, I'm not one of those people. All right, I'm, I tend to be more flexible than that. You can always ask if there's any confusion. Of course, apparently, if you're, if you're, you know, if if you weren't confused, if you were pretty sure that it was due on Monday, that's fine. You can always rework parts of it. If 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 you look at it now and say, well, gee, if I had a little bit more time, I would have done this, that, or the other. That's fine. Do keep in mind that this is a design. A design is not meant to be perfect. Right? The final product ought to be, I will hesitate to use perfect, but ought to be as good as it's going to get. But the design is a sketch. All right? And therefore, what you turn in Monday versus what you turn in Wednesday, not going to be a huge, you know, it gives you a couple days to work on it. Yeah, you might have did a little bit more, but I wouldn't sweat it too much. All right? So that's sort of the, the answer to that question for those of you who weren't sure about when it's due. And some people thought it was due Monday. And if you turn it in Monday, and, you know, you, should, you still should be okay. It will all be okay. Trust me. All right? I, I realize that sounded like, that sounded like I was a con man or something. Trust me. It will be fine. Yeah. But do. You know, it, it should be okay. And if there's anything glaringly wrong, you'll have a chance to rework it. All right? Okay. Onward and upward. On forms. The last thing that we talked about um, on Monday was talking about using forms to communicate between the client and the server. And I'm going to put up my world-renowned diagram again that talks about, that, that describes the manner in which the client and the server interact. We have our 
is the person that is browsing the website. It could be a person on a desktop, laptop, tablet, mobile device, whatever. In IT, we talk a lot about clients and servers. A client is the entity that is making the request, that's asking for something. And the server is the entity that's responding to the request. So therefore, the client is connected to the internet and makes requests to the server. And with plain old HTML, the requests are usually pretty straightforward, such as I click on a link and I want to see such and such page. All right. For some requests, it gets a little more complicated, like when I do a Google search. When I do a Google search, not only do I have to say I want to do a Google search, but I have to provide the search term. I have to provide user input as part of my request. And then the server's going to take that and run it through some script, which is a little program that exists that runs on the server. It's going to take that input and process it and produce just for me an HTML page. We're going to go and we're going to do some searches today using the Bing search engine, simply because it, it works. Uh, it, I, I don't like Bing, but um, it allows me to demonstrate what I want to demonstrate today. So if I go in and Do a search for Zeller's database videos. And I click on that. It returns links to some of my YouTube videos. All right, including the videos for this class and the videos for my database class. In other words, it took what I typed in here and did a custom search through their databases to find and create a web page just for me, for my request. If I do a view source here, I'll see a web page, a gigantic web page a lot of stuff on it. That is a lot of stuff. But, well, keep in mind that, that the, the question was like there was no nesting. Keep in mind that a, a service like Google or Bing gets thou, you know, thousands, nothing, millions of requests a day, right? So therefore for their servers, by eliminating that, those extra spaces, that saves a bunch of bytes that it has to send. So I'm sure when the developers develop their code, it's nested so that they can read it and debug it. But there's a process that they go through when they will, that will take out all the white space because the server don't care, the client don't care, and, and it will deliver it that way. Now if we look closely at the URL, at the request that I made, we'll see something attached to the URL. Let's make this bigger. This is the address that I'm asking for. All right. There's a question mark, and then Q equals Zeller's database video. All right, Q equals Zeller's database video. Zeller's database video is a term that I searched for. So if I look for something else, if I did a search for something else, P 
PHP, for example, and we look at the URL, it's the same URL. I'm requesting the same web page. But, whoops, I'm giving it a different parameter on the query string. So the query string is the mechanism by which I can send what I've typed into the form to the server so that the server can do something with it. All right? Because if I do a search, if I type something in that search box, that has to get to the server so the server knows, oh, okay, this guy did a search on PHP, this guy did a search on Zeller's database video, and so on. How is that accomplished? That's accomplished through the use of a form. A form is where the user can enter data in and send it to the server. Everything after the question mark is called a query string. And what it does is it allows us to send data along with our request so that, the, so that the Bing search engine knows, hey, this is what this person is searching for. So that's a mechanism by which we pass data from the form that we type in to the web server so the web server can create that. Now, as you know from my diagram, for this whole picture to work, we need a script on the web server that can process our input. This is not a class in server-side scripting, so we're going to use the Bing search engine. We're going to use their script, and they let you do it. I mean, it's not like we're, we're sneaking in their, their back door and, and, and doing this. You know, this is something that's permissible. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a form that allows us to enter in a search term Send that to the Bing server, and then the Bing server will send results to us. So I'm going to go in, and I'll create an HTML document. And for this, for purposes of demonstration, I'm not going to put in things like a header or a navigation or anything like that. You would certainly have that if you were doing a, a full-blown web page. But I'm just going to jump in. I'm going to create a section to do the search. I'm going to introduce a couple of new tags to us. The first new tag that we're going to uh, create is the form tag. The form tag wraps around all the data that we want to send to the server. I'm going to leave off the ending part of the start form tag for a second here. Typically, not all the time, but often there's just going to be one form tag per page. Now you can, there are cases where you have two forms on a page. The most common would be if there was a page where you could register for a website or log in if you've already registered. That would probably have two forms because there's two distinct purposes. One is to create a new account, one is to log into an existing account. So there might be two forms for that. In this case, we're just going to be doing a search. So therefore, we are going to um, only have one form tag. The form tag wraps around everything that we want to send to the server. All right? Some students misunderstand and think that there is a form tag for each little piece of data that we want to send. There isn't. 
Think of the form tag as an envelope. And we're going to stuff in that envelope everything that we want to send to the server. Um, to look at a different form, if I go to Angel to log on, the form contains these two fields. All right. If I log on to Angel, and I go to send someone an email, for example, the form has this, 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 and those checkboxes on, along with all these various different buttons, the drop down for priority, and so on. So the form wraps around everything that we're sending to the server. There's two attributes on the form tag. One of them is the method that we're going to send the data via. And the two values are get and post. We're going to use the get method. The get method sends the data on the query string. The reason I'm picking the get method is this will allow us to, to see on the query string the data that we're passing over. If you use the post method, that sends the data, but you don't see it on the URL. That sends the data through another mechanism, through the request object that's created. The action of a form is the name of the server-side script that we want to call. Now usually, this will be a script that we write. If we're developing a web application for a business or whatever, we will write the server-side script. But we don't cover server-side scripting in this class, so we have to use someone else's. And therefore, what we're going to use is we're going to use the script, the search script for Bing. And the name of the script that we want is everything before the question mark. That's the name of the script. Remember, the question mark is where the query string starts. And the query string is the data that we want to send. So I'll go and copy that, put it in my HTML as the action. All right, so that's what we have so far. A form tag, and the end form tag. The form tag has to have the method, and it has to have the action. Now, I say has to have. There are defaults for those if you don't put it in. But it's good practice, typically, to put in the method that you want to use. So there's no surprises. It doesn't take the default. So what we're going to do is we've, we've specified the method and we've specified the action. Now what we want to do is we have to, to, to put the individual form controls. And by form control, I mean the thing that the user actually interacts with. Now, for the Bing search, this form really has two things. There's what's called a text box that we can type into. And then there's a button that we can press. All right? So I'm going to put two things inside my form. And I'm going to leave some space in them because I'm going to come back to them and add some stuff. The tag for a text box is input. Type equals text.
the tag for a submit button is input type equals submit. So, a lot of the form controls simply use the same tag, an input tag. And then they have a different type associated with them, and that's what distinguishes between a button and a text box and a checkbox and so on. So input type equals text will be a text box. Input type equals submit will be a submit button. Now, we have to tell the server what our things mean, what data we're passing over. Because remember, a form can actually have a bunch of stuff on it. If you think of a form when you go to order something online, there might be a place for your name, your address, city, state, zip, your credit card number, expiration date, and so on down the line. So we have to label, we have to identify each of the things on our form with a name. So that the server knows, hey, this box represents the person's first name, this box represents the person's last name, this box represents their credit card number, and so on. Now the name matters. All right, I can't just, in this case, I can't just make up any name. I have to match the name that the server-side script is expecting. All right, now if I wrote both the HTML page and the server-side script, then that's an easy job to do, right? Because I wrote the server-side script, I know what name the server-side script is expecting. However, in this case, someone else wrote the server-side script, so I have to look and see what name they used. How do I do that? It's actually pretty easy. We can tell by the query string. Remember, the query string is what passes all the data over. If we look at the URL, we'll notice that our search term is labeled Q equals. So whatever we're searching for, that needs the name of Q. That is what the Bing server-side script is expecting. It's expecting a value of Q to represent what we've searched for. So, I'm going to go here and I'm going to give this a name equals Q. In this case, the button matters a little bit less, but the button is called Go. So I give a name for the button of Go. So, I'm going to go and save this. On the desktop. And now when I run this, here's my page, if I double click on it, I have a form, so I have a text box, and I have a button. Actually, I missed something on the... I can also specify for the button a value, and the value represents essentially the label that's on the button. So submit query is a default, right. So I have my text box and I have my button. So I can go in and I can do a search for something. Um, 
click Submit, and I've done a search on Bing. All right, yay. All right, notice that the search, it passed to it, and because I passed and I gave it the right name and everything, everything worked out okay. Now, if I gave it the wrong name, if I didn't pay attention to what the name, the, the Bing uh, script was, was expecting, if I just gave it some name, Notice Bing doesn't know what to do with that. So it just, it throws up its arms. It says, I don't know what you're talking about, and therefore I'm going to send you to um, the search page. So we have to match. It's important to know that we have to match the name that the server-side script is expecting. That's not a big deal, though. Because, again, either you're writing both, after you've learned server-side scripting, so you know what name you call the different things in the server-side script, or you can look at either the documentation or the query string or whatever um, to determine what name you need to call it. All right. So that's what we have for forms. All right. As a start. There's, of course, a lot more stuff that, that we can do. For example, we might want a label for the forms. All right? So I could go in and say, enter search. Words. I'm tired. I don't have an imagination to think of a better thing for that. So I could do that, and then we'll see on the screen. Enter search words. Now, we know search words belong to this box because we can see. And we can see that that's right next door to that box. And if there were more text boxes on this page, we'd be able to tell their labels because they would be sitting right next to those text boxes. Someone that's blind, though, that the screen is being read to them might have a problem. So what we can do is this. We can put in a label tag. All right. What did I do? I put a label tag around the text. I said for equals, and that's going to be an ID. And that ID is going to match up to the ID of the thing that it's a label for. And screen readers and other assistive technologies can use that little hook to associate this label with this form element. Now, what difference does that make to you, uh, someone that can see? It doesn't. You're not going to see any difference between with the label tag or without the label tag. Looks identical. But, like the Braille on the door, someone that needs it, it's there for them. All right? Now,
I'm going to see if Bing has R. I'm going to look for. See, shoot, I don't want to do that. Okay. I want to notice a subtle difference between the three query strings here. Let's go to I do a PHP, I do a web search for PHP. I do an image search for PHP. And I do a new search for PHP. Can you see the difference between those? Up to here, they look alike. Q equals PHP. That's the term that we're searching for. What is different between the three, though? What is one thing that we can see? This one has a whole bunch of extra stuff, but form equals QBLH, form equals HDRSC2, Form equals HDRSC6. So that is a description of what we're searching for. The Bing search engine uses this to determine did we do a search for the web? Did we do a search for images? Did we do a search for, um, what was the other one? News. So can we pull that into our page? Let's give it a shot. So I'm going to create another text box and another label. And I'm going to call it search type. I'm going to associate that label with this text box. What name do you think we should call that? What name do we need to call that? Well, the search term is still Q, but the type of search is what? Is form. So I'm going to go here and put in form. For that. I'm going to go and save it. And refresh. Now I have enter search words, enter search type. So I'm going to search for flowers. And for search type, I'm going to put in what is expecting, HDRSC2. I'm wondering if it's case sensitive. because it didn't look like that worked. Let's 
Doesn't seem like it's working. Let's try the other one. Let's try news. I'm going to try one more thing real quick. All right, and that, that did not seem to work, so I'm doing something wrong with that. I guess I'll drop back and punt and remove that from there. All right, so let's stick with what did work, which is this. All right, there we go. Yeah. Um, you bring up the sure. Now, if you were under the action, mm -hmm. if you were to put bing.com slash image slash search and do a different form for images, would that then search the images instead of the search? Well, you would have to know. You, it, it is possible that you could do a different action to cause it to do an image search, but you'd have to match what it was expecting. So you'd have to match the name of the script that it was expecting. So it's possible if I added that on there that that would have got it to work, but um, I'm giving up at this point. You could try that if you wanted to. The main thing I want to get out of this is the way that your web page, the HTML page, communicates with the server-side script. The form sort of serves as an envelope. It's going to be everything that you're going to send to the user. I'm sorry, to the, uh, to the server. And there's different form items that represent stuff that you're going to send. And the name that you call the fields has to match up with the name that the server-side script is expecting. You're going to have an assignment probably next week where you're going to create a form where I've written a script and you need to match up the names that I provide for you. You know, the assumption would be that I was another member of the development team and I did the server-side script processing and, and uh, um, you know, you, you were responsible for doing the, the HTML. Now, the text box and button are the first two form elements that we looked at. All right, they're probably the simplest. What are some other things that you may see on a form? Again, think of your own experience of forms that you've seen. All right, a drop-down box. So we have our text box button. Let me rephrase that. Text box submit button. What's a drop down? What's a drop down? Oh, I don't, that's not very readable. Let's go here. So we had a text box and a submit button. Uh, we said a drop down. What is a drop down? Well, when you click on it, a list of values drops down to allow you to pick. Let's see if we can find that here. Well, display, display language. 
This one's actually called, you know, this one actually is a drop up, all right, because um, of the way it's positioned on the screen, but normally it would drop down and you could pick from there. Why do you use a drop down instead of a text box? What advantage does a drop down give us as opposed to a text box? More options? Right. It's not so much that there's more options, it's that it defines exactly what their options are. For example, let's look at this. All right. Francais instead of French or France. All right. If someone didn't know, they're liable to put in French or whatever. Here's probably even a better one. There's two Portuguese, the Brazilian dialect of Portuguese and then the Portugal version of Portuguese. Now, if the web server is expecting that data to come in a certain way, then we couldn't just give a text box because someone might type in Portuguese Brazil, someone might type in Brazil Portuguese, and the server wouldn't know how to deal with it. Therefore, what, does, what the drop-down does is it limits the number of options that you have. All right. So instead of giving them a text box where they could type any old thing in, you give them a drop down where they're limited as to what they can select. That way the server can stand a better chance of processing it. What else besides a, a drop down? What are some other things? Right, the little bubble. All right. Like, for example, here, there's a safe search. Strict, moderate, and I'm not going to dare click on off, all right? So we'll go between strict or moderate. Those are called radio buttons. Why? Because they're like the radio in your car, right? The radio in your car, if you press a button, if you're listening to one station and you press another button, the old station goes off and the new station comes on. Your radio can only be playing one station at a time, all right? So only one button is active, if you will, at a time. And that's what these are like. So in other words, I could not click both of these. As soon as I click one, the other one goes off. I just can't do it, no matter what I try to do. Control click, show, you know, it doesn't matter. Those are called radio buttons. Those are similar to a drop-down in the sense that they give you what your options are and you get to pick one of those options. For example, here, safe search. There's only three choices, all right? If they had a text box, people could type in anything they wanted. Well, the server might not know how to handle any of that. The server knows how to handle these three choices. So therefore, the form gives only these three choices. All right? In that way, this is very similar to a drop-down, right? In a drop-down, you're given a list of choices to pick from. What's the difference then between a drop-down and a radio button? When, when might you use one versus the other? Drop down saves space. So when might you use a drop down? You have a lot more options, right. In other words, if I tried to have a radio button for all of these, that would take up a big chunk of the screen. The drop down saves space. So I can present it in a very concise manner. What's the advantage of a radio button then? It's, it's clear, right? In other words, all the choices are laid out there in front of you. You don't have to click on something and look down and search through the list. All right? So usually, 
you know, you could use either a drop down or a radio button for anything where there's a list of limited options. But usually you look at it and see, gee, do I want to save space? Do I want to make it clear what all the choices are? So some things you could do a couple different ways, and that's your job as a web designer to look at this and say, all right, um, for languages, there's a couple dozen languages. I'm going to use a drop-down to save so there's not a big block of radio buttons on my page. Whereas with the save search options, there's only two or three of them. So I'm, I'm just going to do those. Other form controls. I know you've seen them all, it's just a matter of remembering and realizing that they're different. Uh, the, the, the CAPTCHA for that, 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 is, uh, a f that is typically its own form and that would simply be an image, a text box, and a button probably. Down here is one, a checkbox. checkbox is where there are two options. Typically yes or no, true or false, however you want to call it. I could do radio buttons for those. I could do a drop down for those, right? But a checkbox is very, very, very concise, all right? In other words, do you, want, do you want to see suggestions? Turn suggestions on. Yes? No. All right, there's no some of the time or whatever. It's either yes or no. I could do this with two radio buttons. I could do this with a drop down. But yes or no, oftentimes a checkbox is done. There's a couple more. One is called a text area. What do you suppose the difference between a text box and a text area is? Right, you, you, have, you have more space in a text area. So someone's name is going to be a text box, all right, because someone's name typically is just one line. Whereas if I said, you know, here are, here's a place for you to enter your comments for this Facebook post. That's liable to be a text area because you're liable to have more than one line. You're liable to have multiple lines. All right. There are actually a couple more. And we'll put them up here. And next time we'll talk a little bit more about when to use them and we'll show how to use them. There's a password control. What do you suppose is the big deal with the password control? You don't see what is typed into it. There is a plain old button. These are typically tied to JavaScript. A submit button sends your request to the server. A plain old button is simply used to invoke some JavaScript. There is a reset button. And you should very rarely use this, and we'll talk about that next time. Don't use reset buttons. Reset buttons typically cause more confusion than they're worth. All right? And we'll look at some examples, or we'll look at a example right here on this college's website of how a reset button can cause trouble. So our plan for next week, we'll talk about these different controls. We'll also talk about some of your styling options for these. Because so far I've just put the things on a form, just one thing after another. We'll, we'll look at styling it to make our forms look good. And some of the ways that we can group items for both accessibility and for appearance. All right. That's all I had for today. Uh, time for lab. Okay in Ridgeville? Okay.